This presentation is about how to construct a cladogram. Now a cladogram is a, an evolutionary diagram showing how different groups are related or we sometimes call them a phylogeny. Let me uh, use an example for this. We're going to use an example of constructing uh, a cladogram uh, to classify of course the most awesome insects on the planet, stoneflies. Okay, let's say we have a list of data here about three different species of stoneflies. And in order to construct this cladogram, we also need to know what the ancestral condition of these stoneflies were to begin with. So if you look at the bottom row, that tells us our, our ancestral condition from which things may have evolved later on. Just let me give you a little background about what it means when it says Circe or Epiproct, because I, I don't figure most everybody knows what that is. It doesn't really matter what the... I'm just using this as an example. It could be about classifying cats, dogs, uh, birds, sponges, whatever. Let's just use this as an example. Okay, so here, just a quick diagram of a stonefly. Dorsal view from the top and lateral view from the side. Uh, let me just label a few things. These, of course, everybody knows are antennae. They're not listed in our data for our cladogram because all stoneflies have them. They don't really tell us anything. Of course, everybody realizes these are wings, and it turns out that some stoneflies lack wings or have very short stubby vestigial wings. These tails sticking out the back are called circe. Okay, that's in our table of data. And on the back uh, at the end, uh, part of the reproductive structure is called an epiproct for the males. So that could be very important in our classification because some have different type. And then as these stoneflies are gripping onto the rocks, water is flowing over them. They live in streams, freshwater streams and these little things sticking out of their body, some uh, different places in their body, these are gills. And it turns out that some stoneflies have the gills and some don't. So that could be useful to classify. Always you need differences between the organisms in order to classify them. And the last thing, it turns out that some stoneflies, when they're trying to find a mate, will tap a message, a certain pattern, a rhythm, on the, the ground or the trees that they're in, with their end of their abdomen. So imagine this thing is tapping up and down on the uh, substrate to try to find a mate. That's drumming behavior. And it turns out some stoneflies do that and others don't. So we can use these traits to help classify how these stoneflies might be related. So if we look at this data, we can see how, which species have which traits. And we're going to compile this data into an, a cladogram showing how species 1, 2, and 3 might be related to each other. The first step in constructing a cladogram is to find the ancestral condition. Now, of course, that can be very difficult to do, and that's, it takes years for some biologists to, to try to sort out what was the ancestral condition. But basically, you do it by comparing lots and lots of organisms to each other and trying to, to figure out what, uh, what traits are, are more complex, how things evolve. But we'll say, for our purposes, we already know the ancestral condition. Uh, second step is to draw all the possible arrangements of how these species might be related. Sketch all possible relationships. So for our example here, we see three possible relationships. With species one and two more closely related and three more distant, one more distant and two and three closer to each other, or one and three are more similar and two is distant. And that's all the possible combinations we could have. Now, the next step is to mark down which mutations would have been required to get the pattern that we see in the data. So we're going to start with wings. We know that long wings was the ancestral condition. And we'll use uh, a purple mark to indicate every time a mutation would have had to happen. So if we look in the first possible relationship, uh, species 1 already has long wings, 2 has long wings, but 3 had short wings, so we're going to put a little hash mark there saying there would have had to be a mutation in species 3. The middle tree, we would have had to have a mutation right there, and in the last tree, right there. Now let's look at Circe. We'll mark Circe mutations in orange. Long Circe were ancestral, so species 1 and 3 had mutations happen. So it could have happened like that, like that, or like this. In the last tree, if we had one mutation, it could have resulted in both one and three getting that as they descended and diverged later on. Okay, now for gills. 
We'll use blue to represent gill mutations, which started out as gills being present in ancestral stoneflies. So species two and three had to have mutations happen, which could have happened like that. A single mutation there in the middle tree, or two separate mutations there in the last tree. The epiproct next also started out as single, and only species three has a mutation making a fork. So we could put a mutation there, there, there. And drumming behavior is not ancestral, and so species one and three both had mutations to acquire that. So we could have had that there, 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 and there, and perhaps there ancestral to both. Now that we've marked all the mutations that would have had to occur, the next step is to just count up how many mutations would have happened in each possible tree. And we look in the first tree, eight mutations would have been required. Seven mutations in the middle tree and six in the last possibility. And so most likely if we if we use the logic that the most likely tree would be the one requiring the fewest mutations, which by the way is called the principle of parsimony, it's that the simplest explanation is the most likely, we would choose tree number three to be the the correct cladogram or evolutionary phylogeny of this group of stoneflies, that one and three are more closely related to each other and two is more distant. So again, just recapping the steps, you find the ancestral condition, sketch all possible relationships, then you mark all required mutations, and then total the mutations, and select the most parsimonious tree or the one requiring the fewest mutations. Now that's not always the case. Uh, some phylogenists prefer other methods. Uh, instead of parsimony, another technique is called maximum likelihood, and that takes into account that not all mutations are equally likely. And, uh, and so there are different statistical tools that can be used to, to try to sort out what would be the most likely tree possible. Now, of course, this example only used three, uh, sp three different species. Uh, you can imagine the the work it would take if you had five or ten or fifteen or a thousand different species and you're trying to sort out how they're related. And that's why with the modern computing technology that we have that's so useful. Computers can sort through that data much more quickly than we can by hand. And uh, that's basically how you set up a an evolutionary tree or a cladogram. Now the same thing can be done not just with lists of species but if we actually had uh, DNA sequence data we don't have to use uh, morphological traits. We can use uh, uh, bases of DNA as our, as our differences. So here again, we have three different species, species one, two, and three, and an ancestral state that uh, this, these uh, species evolved from. We can set up the same kind of a, a tree to decide what was the ancestral condition. Let's just do that as an example. Again, we set up all possible trees, and then we note any differences. So we'll use blue mutations for column number one, and the ancestral condition was an A, so species one and two both had mutations. Column two, let's make that red mutations, and we'll note that the ancestral condition was G, and again, species one and two have mutations. Column three, we'll use green, and the ancestral condition being T, we had species one and three with mutations. Column four, we'll use purple mutations, and species two and three had mutations. Then we just total up the number of mutations. Six for tree one, seven for tree two, and seven for tree three. So again, tree one has the fewest mutations, would be the most parsimonious solution. So we could select that as the most likely evolutionary tree, the most likely cladogram. Again, that's how we, how we construct cladograms or evolutionary phylogeny.